When I created my first video on evidence, I was operating under the inference that almost all of my viewers had both experienced evidence and had been aware of experiencing evidence from their daily and academic lives that already supported the arguments I was making. And so I inferred that most of the arguments I was making would be pretty uncontroversial. As I discovered from some of the critiques I received in the comment section and video responses, however, I was quite mistaken in that inference. So before moving on to the next part, I'll respond to some of these criticisms and shore up the arguments I made in the first video. Not that this is a bad thing. Responding to these criticisms strengthens the comprehensiveness of the foundations of evidentialism. To begin my epistemological journey, I made two provisional assumptions. I exist, and my senses are sometimes accurate. These provisional assumptions might be wrong. They're just hypotheses. But if I don't assume them, I have nowhere to go epistemologically. I would have no power to infer anything about the world around me. Now despite this, some people immediately jump ship at this point saying, you can't just assume that, which was a response that at first I found a bit perplexing. What exactly are these people trying to say? Are they arguing that they don't assume their own existence? Are they arguing that they don't assume their senses are ever accurate? Anyone taking such a stance would be espousing radical skepticism, which is the philosophical position that knowledge is impossible, and this position takes us nowhere. If this is our stance, then it's game over, epistemologically. There's nothing to think and nothing to do because we can believe nothing. Either you make these provisional assumptions with me, or you choose to believe nothing. I don't really see any alternatives. This appears to be a true dichotomy. But there's another, more reasonable concern about these basic assumptions. Some people have argued that if I make these basic assumptions, I can just assume whatever I want. But that isn't true. If I were assuming whatever I want, I would assume I exist, assume my senses are sometimes accurate, assume the natural world is all there is, assume there is no god, assume that abiogenesis did not originate from an intelligence, Assume there was no intelligent design in genetic diversity. Assume all religious experiences are delusions, and so on. Alternatively, I could assume I exist, assume my senses are sometimes accurate, assume there is a supernatural, assume there is a god, assume this god created all life, assume I am going to an afterlife when I die, assume that god is guiding my life, and so on. But I'm not taking either of those highly presumptive stances. On the contrary, I am assuming as little as possible just to function in the world and then letting the evidence tell me the rest. Another criticism was that while I make assumptions, rationalists like Descartes don't make assumptions. Rationalists are just observing a priori truths. To which my response is, how can you know a priori whether something is a truth. To which a common answer is, you can know a set of statements are true if they are internally consistent. Well first, that is an assumption. But let's entertain this principle and see how well it holds up. This type of epistemology is called coherentism. Namely, beliefs are true if they are members of a coherent set of beliefs which both support and don't contradict each other. The beliefs are internally consistent. Though coherentism has problems that can be illuminated right out of the gate. Take three different religions, Islam, Christianity, and Hinduism. All three of these religions can be formulated in a way that they are internally consistent. But clearly, they all contradict each other. Therefore, they can't all be true. Therefore, internal consistency among a set of beliefs is not sufficient for truth. This is called the isolation objection to coherentism. Namely, a set of beliefs can be internally consistent in isolation without actually being true. And at least two, if not all of these religions must be false since they can't all be true. Now, while internal consistency is not a sufficient condition for an epistemology, it does appear to be a necessary condition.
And the argument of evidentialism is that it is coherent because the physical universe itself is coherent. This is not just an assumption. This is an evidence-based argument. It can be built off of evidence-based sub-arguments, such as the fact that multiple independently manufactured temperature gauges will all report the same temperature in the same geographical location at the same time within a given error range. So the claim of internal consistency doesn't rescue rationalists from the fact that they are making at least some assumptions, just like me. No matter how much you may try to squirm out of it by euphemistically labeling your assumption as self-evident or as an a priori truth, the reality is you are making an assumption. And it is more dangerous to unconsciously make an assumption but confidently label it as a truth than it is to consciously make an assumption and humbly be prepared to discover that it isn't true. Another very common objection to evidentialism is that it is self-refuting. Namely, if I say, only beliefs that are justified by evidence are valid, that claim itself is not supported by evidence. In my previous video, my implicit answer to this supposed refutation was that every belief except these five provisional assumptions or hypotheses needs to be justified by evidence. Which is a pretty good answer. Because it's not like the first two hypotheses are shielded from themselves either. For example, if you say, I think, therefore I am, your statement itself assumes the existence of an I who can think. And if you say, my senses are sometimes correct, how are you going to prove that? With your senses? Therefore, again, these first five can just be taken as provisional hypotheses that are open to future refutation or revision. But I can do better than that. Let's take another approach so I can quell any possible objections that evidentialism is self-refuting. Most rationalists, even Descartes, do believe that physical evidence is a valid way of justifying beliefs. So let's scrap that third set of hypotheses and add this as a provisional assumption that we all share. Using this shared assumption, the thesis of evidentialism is that all beliefs are justified by physical evidence. This is no longer a simple assumption. We are upgrading this to a full-fledged, large-scale, evidence-based argument. And as I just said, that's okay. Because even rationalists agree that physical evidence is a valid form of justification. So what is the evidence for this argument? Well, it contains many sub-arguments and my series serves as one of the many platforms that presents sub-arguments to support it. And I will present further evidence for this thesis now. One of the criticisms leveled at the thesis of evidentialism by many atheists was that some beliefs are true, but not based on physical evidence. One of the most common examples was mathematics. Math, they claim, is a purely rational activity. It has no basis in evidence. Mathematics is based on proofs, and proofs are purely rational. Let's examine this claim. The generally accepted basis for all of mathematics is set theory. For example, zermelo frankel set theory. Set theory discusses sets, which are well-defined collections of objects. But where does the idea of sets itself come from? I think the evidence indicates that the origin of the idea of sets is pretty clearly the physical universe. Without a physical universe containing collections of discrete objects, how would we abstract the idea of sets? Imagine we lived in a universe where there were no discrete objects, where all things oozed and melded into each other. How would we ever abstract the idea of sets in such a universe? Or imagine that our brains were initialized into a blank empty space. How would we ever abstract the idea of sets if there was nothing to collect? From sets, we can abstract the idea of numbers, which are labelings of specific set sizes. From numbers, we can abstract the idea of addition, which is the combination of subsets. Subtraction, which is the removal of subsets. Multiplication which is the duplication of a single set a specific number of times to form a superset. Division, 
which is the uniform distribution of a single set into a specific number of subsets. Squares, which are the multiplication of a number times itself. Square roots, which are the inverse of this operation. Infinity, which is the abstraction of imagining what would happen if we started adding and never stopped. Negative numbers, which are an abstraction from positive numbers by imagining they stretched into infinity in the opposite direction. And because when two square roots of the same number are multiplied, they reproduce that number, we can then abstract to the idea of an imaginary number, the square root of negative one. Abstractions of abstractions of abstractions. This is what mathematics is. And the abstractions of mathematics are only possible because we live in a universe of discrete physical objects which can be grouped into sets. Without those objects, we never would have had anything to abstract from. Over time, we've had to formalize our abstractions based on other abstractions because of paradoxes we discovered in still other abstractions. This has caused us to periodically return to our mathematical foundations and modify them. But I think that the basic ideas of mathematics pretty clearly derive ultimately by abstracting from physical evidence. And this has proven very fruitful for us as a species when isomorphisms between our abstractions and the physical universe allow us to return to the physical universe and apply our abstractions to engineering applications. But what about logic? Logic isn't based on evidence, is it? And mathematics is based on logic. On the contrary, I think it is pretty clear that logic also is ultimately just an abstraction of physical experience based on physical evidence. Let's take modus ponens, for example. If A, then B. A, therefore B. This is so abstract. How could this possibly be based on physical experience? The answer? The evidence of physical causation. If it rains, I get wet. If I touch fire, I get burned. If I drop this glass, I will break it. A little reflection reveals just how ubiquitous this concept is in physical experience, and just how easily we could abstract it from physical evidence. This is strong evidence that the concept of modus ponens is just an abstraction of physical experience. I think the extreme irony of this situation is that we have experienced so much evidence for these abstractions that we no longer need evidence to remember and apply them. And so we find ourselves under the illusion that they are self-evident. But if you ever need a reminder that these statements are not self-evident, just walk into a kindergarten classroom and start spouting them as self-evident truths and expect the children to remember and understand them. You will likely be reminded very quickly that these are not self-evident truths. They are abstractions based on physical evidence. And if you want people who have not yet experienced the evidence for these abstractions to comprehend, remember, and believe them, you must present the evidence for them. This understanding of abstraction centers around the fact that we have an embodied mind, a mind that exists within a body. One of the most visible proponents of the embodied mind argument is George Lakoff, a cognitive linguist. He and Rafael Nunez present arguments similar to mine in the book Where Mathematics Comes From, How the Embodied Mind Brings Mathematics Into Being. It is held by embodied mind proponents that mathematics and logic do not actually exist in any real sense other than in human brains. Rather, we construct mathematics and logic by abstracting from the embodied experiences that we have. In other words, from the physical evidence we experience. I think this argument has profound implications for the teaching of abstract disciplines like mathematics. Because teachers with a rationalist approach will likely focus on memorizing abstract mathematical truths as if they are self-evident. But teachers with an evidentialist approach will focus on presenting examples that justify the abstractions. The evidentialist will present both the abstraction and the evidence it is based on. The rationalist will only present the abstraction, missing half of the argument, and in my experience, confusing students and obfuscating the learning process. Another failed approach is presenting the examples without the abstraction. 
A lot of my ire towards rationalism stems precisely from being subjected to rationalist teaching approaches as a student in a highly mathematical discipline. It also stems from being a teacher in that discipline and witnessing other teaching assistants confuse the hell out of their students with rationalist approaches and then complain because their students just weren't getting it. Based on what I've seen from cognitive psychology, the learning process is extremely evidence-based, where good teachers present abstractions and explain the evidence needed to support them, or present the evidence and explain the abstractions that can be drawn from it. This is related to the formation of semantic and episodic memories, which I'll explain later in the series. In fact, I suspect that evidentialism will win this argument precisely because it's the actual basis of human learning and rationalism isn't. And therefore, rationalism, in trying to defend itself as an epistemology, will likely always come across as more muddled and confused to an audience than evidentialism will. I think rationalism stems from a kind of laziness about abstractions, leaving the job of justification half done and simply labeling some of the abstractions as a priori truths or self-evident, whereas an evidentialist will take the time to try to investigate and explain where all of our abstractions come from, or at least have the intellectual honesty to admit when the job of justification isn't yet finished. But that's enough criticism of rationalism for now. Let's move on to my final note on what evidentialism is not. A final complaint from many people was that this is just logical positivism. First, no, it isn't. Evidentialism is its own position with its own publications, its own principles, and its own arguments. Second, that's not an argument. If you believe that there is something wrong with either evidentialism or logical positivism, it is your responsibility to make at least a brief argument for what that problem is. A mere appeal to convention is not sufficient. With these critiques addressed, I think this is a sufficient amount of defense for evidentialism to justify moving on. If you would like to present an alternative epistemology that you think better explains justification, you're free to do so. Feel free to attach it as a video response. But I think of sufficiently justified evidentialism to the point that we can talk about what happens when we apply evidentialism to the hypothesis of God.